All right, so again, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Yabwa. I'm the program director at Art and Feminism. Um, and um, we're really excited to be having this conversation today. For those of you who are not familiar with Art and Feminism, uh, we are a community of information activists um, who are committed to closing information gaps related to feminism, gender, and the arts. Uh, that's a really fancy way of saying we really like editing Wikipedia and making sure that the information that, you know, billions of people access uh, is uh, reflected in a way that represents, you know, our histories and um, people who are often erased from the public record. Um, so we definitely invite you all to join us. We have our annual campaign where event organizers host art and feminism edit-a-thons um, in their communities. Uh, so you can join in as an editor attending any of those events or create your own event. And please do email us if you are interested in joining the campaign or check out our website. So this year, which is year 11 for us, our theme is solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. We're not all in this together. Um, and as part of that theme, We've been hosting several virtual events, including this conversation series. You can watch the replay of our first conversation, uh, which featured uh, Sophie Reverdy, who is a Wikimedian and librarian, and some of her collaborators for the Abortion in Maryland edit-a-thon. Um, it was a really great event, which uh, really emphasized the importance of the work that we do and um, making sure that again, like the public access to information about abortion in a specific state is accurate um, and documented in a progressive uh, feminist way. So definitely recommend you go check that out. The recording is available on our YouTube page and also in Wikimedia Commons. Today, which is our second and final conversation, um, we're here with Hope Leanne Vinson, Patricia Bordayo de Bodox, Nazir Anthony Montavo, and Chad Onyanwa, um, who are all artists and organizers living in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, this panel was organized by Hope, uh, who has done a great job over the past few months, like, you know, giving me updates and having conversations with me. And I'm really excited um, about this. this um, this conversation today. So I'm going to quickly read Hope's bio and then turn it over to them. So Hope Leanne Vinson is a Kansas City-based visual artist whose work recasts elements of the built environment to explore internal narratives of history and identity. They earned their BFA in painting and art history and completed their social practice certificate from the Kansas City Art Institute. They have showcased their work in um, Midway Atlas, Site One, Sapien Gallery, and was a past resident of the Chopwood Carry Water Artist Residency in the Driftless region of Northwest Illinois. They recently served as the Marketing and Communications Manager at Charlotte Street, supporting contemporary artists at various career stages and disciplines and is now working in arts and media, publishing through the Public Media Institute in Chicago. So I will turn it over to Hope now, um, and thank you for being here. I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Nina, for inviting um, me to organize this panel um, and for being so open to um, all the folks that are invited here to speak today. Um, so in starting this panel, I'm just gonna start with uh, introducing Patricia. Um, Patricia is a Mexican-born organizer, artist, and educator in Kansas City, Missouri, where she immigrated at eight. In addition to visual art, Patricia practice extends the collective social and political action to envision a better future for her community and beyond. Her work has been displayed nationally and internationally in Australia. Um, she has been the campaign manager for Janae for KC, a city council race to elect Janae Manley for Kansas City Council Second District at Large in 2023. She served as a CHWC Artist and Fellowship in Kansas City, Kansas from 2022 to 2023, 
leading to a permanent research fellowship focused on the intersection of arts, communities, neighborhoods, and development. Uh, Patricia has served um, as the co-lead for the strategy team for Kansas City Citywide Tenant Union, KC Tenants. Um, she has also served on the advisory board for Rose House Residency, um, which is an artist residency program for low-income BIPOC artists in upstate New York. Um, so Patricia loves her community, her dog, swimming, and feeling the sun work on her face. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the next person I want to introduce is Nasir Anthony Montalvo. So Nasir is a transdisciplinary artist ar archivist based in Kansas City, Missouri, founder of a new Black queer art cultural project in Kansas City titled BQ, BQKC. Montalvo is using the archive as a tool to build power across Black queer generations, accessibly storytelling through digital and analog media, and fight fascist indoctrination in Missouri. Outside of their personal practice, Montalvo is the managing editor for the Black abolitionist media organization, the Kansas City Defender, and sits on the advisory board for Race Project KC, a community organization teaching K through 12 students about racial injustice in Missouri and Kansas. Montalvo and their practice is supported by local, national, and international organizations, including Storytelling for All, excuse me, Stories for All, Diaspora Solidarities Lab, and the Solution Journalism Network. They've been featured in The Advocate, NPR, Teen Vogue, Cosmopolitan, Hello Giggles, and various other local media publications. Montalvo is a queer Africa, Afro, Borkua, and originally from Kiss Me, Florida. So thank you so much for joining um, And the last person I'm going to introduce is Chad Oniwa. Chad is a writer and designer based in Kansas City, Missouri, originally from Wichita, Kansas with a background in arts and culture writing and broadcast journalism. Their primary interests are around visual communication, the connections between global and the local and how we determine value. Um, these topics are con consolidated in projects like Region Journal, um, which you can find on Instagram, just at Region Journal, um, of which they're a founding editor and designer. Uh, so these days, Chad's writing is focused on conversations around creative labor, the local arts industry, um, and how these issues connect to Kansas City's political landscape. So um, if you haven't gathered already, um, I'm joined by three incredible leaders, um, artists, community organizers um, in Kansas City. Um, I'm so excited to share space with them. Um, and I just wanted to start this conversation um, by sharing a statement that was written by organizers uh, affiliated with uh, Rawi which is the radius of Arab American writers. Um, and this is a letter they wrote um, for uh, the AWP conference, which is held in Kansas City uh, this past February. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering today during an act of genocide taking place in Gaza and recognize that the current violence in Palestine is a result of decades of colonial violence and ethnic cleansing under Israeli apartheid. We stand in solidarity with victims of genocide in Sudan and Congo and with the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands myself and the panelists are based, including the Chickapoo, Pa, Kansa, Osage, Ochiti, Shakowen, Shawnee, and Wyandotte people. We stand firmly against anti-Blackness and recognize that police violence and all white supremacist violence must be named and opposed from the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, to the struggle to free Palestine and beyond, the imagination and efforts of many resistant movements in Arab countries would not be possible without the continued solidarity of Black resistant movements, as well as the labor of Black radical intellectuals who have built and contributed to much of the language underlying our conceptions of resistance. Furthermore, this panel is composed of individuals who reside in Missouri, a state, that has enacted violent anti-trans legislation that intentionally endangers the lives of queer, trans, gender non-conforming, and non-binary people. These forms of violence disproportionately target Black and racialized trans youth, which has spurred Kansas City to declare itself an LGBTQIA sanctuary city. Uh, therefore, as we begin our event, uh, we wish to underscore that none of us are free until all of us are free and that all anti-racist, 
liberationist and decolonial struggles are intertwined. Um, and so that was, right, you can see in the chat, the original statement um, was a letter that was sent to uh, panelists at AWP, where uh, a conference of over 12,000 attendees and 800 book fair exhibitors uh, gathered to amplify voices in creative writing. Um, so in anticipation of this event, Rowie and other SWANA organizers asked panelists to share the statement acknowledging the ongoing genocide happening in Palestine, uh, which AWP responded by condemning the statement saying that there is a zero tolerance policy for harassment or hostile behavior. Um, and so it felt appropriate in this panel about art solidarity and the roles that each of us bear. Uh, it felt pertinent to talk about the political landscape of what's happening in Kansas City and how are each of these panelists, um, you know, what, what, what actions do these kind of statements invoke? Um, and so without further ado, um, thank you, Chad, Patricia, Nasir, for joining me in this conversation. Um, and I would just wanted to start by asking the first question, which um, you know, refers to the way institutions often co-op or flatten movement work um, and how artists, cultural workers, and community organizers are re-energizing ideas of solidarity by using new languages or meaning. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ho. Yeah, I can jump in first. This is Nasir, by the way. Um, thank you for that opening speech as well. So to answer your question, uh, I think my answer definitely uh, mirrors kind of what you just said about AWP uh, and refusing to read the statement on the genocide in Gaza and that I feel like uh, modern day misconceptions of solidarity often uh, go towards being like objective uh, and like co-opting like inclusivity to mean like including harmful uh, harmful ideas of what inclusion means. Um, and so uh, kind of where I'm going with this uh, is right now I work with the Kansas City Defender and we're a black abolitionist media organization. Uh, and I think another common misconception is that news organizations are supposed to be objective and that the people uh, bringing our news aren't supposed to have like their own like conceptions or moral compasses of what is right and what is wrong. Um, and of course, like without these moral compasses, we can not move closer towards solidarity. Uh, and so the defender specifically uh, calls itself a radical organization, an abolitionist organization uh, that we're committed to truth, justice, and Black liberation. Uh, and aside from us being a media organization, we understand that like the news that we're reporting on in Kansas City uh, that is often dealing with Black trauma, Black struggle, and Black violence uh, in Kansas City and in Missouri and Kansas overall uh that we also need to be taking actions to change the the news that we're reporting on every day so like in like the left wing of our organization um we have like three committees that are on like mutual aid political education and arts and culture and these three committees uh all do their own like events and programming around um just creating better Black future for Kansas Cityans. Uh, and so I say all that to say that uh, solidarity is not a concept that it can be approached with objectivity. Uh, it is subjective, it is explicitly subjective. Um, and so I too would condemn AWP or other organizations who view their spaces as spaces of solidarity um, when in actuality they're trying to create, create their spaces free of like any political or social discourse that are moving the needle forward towards liberation for our communities. Uh, and so yeah, just to sum it up, I think that uh, artists, cultural workers, community organizers are energizing this idea of solidarity um, by pushing the needle uh, and being explicitly subjective. 
Yeah, I think um, related to that, this is Chad talking, by the way. Um, a lot of my answers actually are very related to what Nasir just said, which is like, I mean, I think one thing that it really comes down to how I how I see it is like risk. I feel like I've been learning a lot about that recently. And I guess like a lot of the work that I'm engaging in and any of the, like, the organizing I've been a part of, it's like, I think solidarity comes down to like assessing what risks we're willing to take to, I guess, essentially like embody the values that we believe in. And sometimes, honestly, risk is really even just showing up, you know what I mean? Showing up for um, showing up for the people who need your, who uh, need you to be there for them, showing up to make sure everybody knows that you have their back. And in the situations of like we're talking about with cultural institutions sort of being, uh, you know, um, dismissive or I guess condemning um, these statements of solidarity or actions of solidarity, I think it's honestly, those are the places where I think we need where I think we do see it. And I think those we need to see more of that, right, is like taking more risk when we're in the, when we're, we have access to those spaces to, I could think again, like Nas said, push the needle um, so that we uh, can actually be moving closer. I think, well, actually I'm just, there's so many threads in my mind, but again, I, I think a lot of it is so that these institutions aren't able to exploit our stories, right? Like again, all these places want to talk about how they're like platforming queer, black, trans, whatever, disabled, neurotyp, you know, atypical artists or whatever else individuals. But then when you speak up about, say, like a shooting or police violence, you know, genocide, bombings, whatever else, you know, then it's a problem, right? But I mean, we're talking about these struggles being interconnected. So yeah, I think it's a lot of it is um, taking those risks, showing up. Um, another thing I was thinking about related to this question is, um, I guess it's kind of like attention, like where we put our attention, um, just so I think solidarity looks a lot like, um, giving our attention, putting our attention where it's needed. Um, and especially I think in a world where, you know, so much of our attention is mined for the profit of, you know, various tech, I don't know, oligarchies or whatever, you know, like, it actually makes a large difference where what we pay attention to. And I think we're starting, especially as, you know, a lot more people started being put, uh, learning more about like the BDS movement um, with um, Palestine. I think a lot that was on the consumer side, we've been talking a lot more about it. And I think we're only moving closer to being more like, okay, so like what is next actually? So social media sure is a great place for us to connect, but also again, like, their platform, you know, they platform hate in a lot of ways, especially like X, right? And they're very uh, biased in who they choose to censor and who they don't. So I do think that, again, our attention is very critical in, you know, today. So I think it, another form of solidarity that we're seeing growing is also maybe like choosing to essentially opt into like smaller um, forms of connection and uh, maybe less uh, forms of connection or relation or education that aren't as, I guess, visible via social media or whatever else. So, um, or that maybe aren't owned by, say, Google or, you know, whoever else. Um, so, yeah, I, again, just I think attention, I think, plays a large role in our solidarity. And yeah, as well as just like the being taking risks, like remembering to take risks and be bold in that aspect and show up for people. Um, I, yeah, those, I want to raise what Nasir and Chad have both said on their own, um, because I resonate with a lot of that. Um, I think being, uh, bold in your values, um, and ruthless in making sure that they're being practiced on a personal level is first and foremost, um, I, in 2020, I got fired from the Kansas City Art Institute for shining light on stuff that was, going um, really wrong there um, systemically on, you know, interpersonal levels. Like I had been working there and went to school there. So I had been around for like almost close to a decade and it just kind of came to a tipping point where I realized that like, because you are 
in an environment where you feel comfortable, if you don't actually like know your own values and know the values of the people that you're like working alongside, ultimately like the drop of a hat can actually like just change the entire situation. And that happened to me. And when I, you know, I had been running a gallery, um, I, you know, an artist run space in Kansas City. I was part of a really cool studio collective called The Drugstore in Kansas City. Like all of that around 2019 and 2020 just like got uprooted. And I looked at myself, like the people who knew me then, um, <laughs> I think were pretty like concerned about me because, you know, I looked at my life and I was like, if I'm not an artist, if I'm not in the artist community, like who am I? Um, and I think I let my entire identity you know, like being an artist became about doing and not just like being <laughs> myself. So it felt like a pretty like difficult stripping of who I thought I was. Um, and that ultimately led me to, um, I took about a year of like time away from my studio, time away from Kansas City even, um, which was a huge privilege, but I, yeah, I just kind of like laid low. And when I came back, I started organizing with Casey Tennant soon after. And through that, um, I learned a lot about value first work, where it's just like you put value in the people alongside you, uh, learn about what they believe in, who like, you know, where they come from, and try to build work around what a collective needs and not just you know, self-serving institutions, self-serving people. Like I know that when I was doing stuff in the arts community, like I was a lone wolf a lot. Um, so I think like re-energizing the word artist to me meant kind of just like looking at it and being like, what it even like, am I outside of it? And I think it has brought me a lot of clarity about the type of artist I wanna be um, after like the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you named this like tension with like the idea of like what it means to be an artist, right? Um, if you're not an artist committing artistry towards art industry, you know, if you're not uh, uh, feeding into these things, then like, there's this like sort of existential question of like, then, then what are you doing, you know? Um, and I, I think that like, it's interesting to me, like in organizing this panel, having conversations with each of you, it was really clear that like, there was a through line of like people having tension to the ideas of like, what does it mean to be an artist in community? Artists is like, idea of artists is so divorced from community. It was sort of like outside of made exception of like the everyday. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are ways in which like each of you, like in your role, um, like challenge the idea of like what artist means and sort of like redefining it through maybe like more community centric ways. And so, um, I'm sort of interested in, in how each of you are sort of redefining that term. Um, also challenging this idea of like, um, you know, if you are like somebody who has a creative background, who is sort of like involved in community organizing or movement work, there is this, um, you know, this, 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 this idea of, of social practice, which is like making art that's in service of like social movements, right? But, um, you know, the way that each of you show up in these spaces is, um, and in so many in so many roles um, that isn't exclusively about like necessarily making art. Um, and so I'm kind of interested in hearing from each of you how you're expanding the term and like how would you sort of redefine it to re better represent the work that you do. Um, I can I can start. This is Chad again. Um, yeah, I think sometimes I I like laugh because I feel like I make maybe when people ask ask me like oh you're an artist right and I always I always feel kind of like difficult because I'm always like eh, I maybe mean, no nah, not exactly you know what I mean but uh I mean so yeah I do I'm like a creative person and I make stuff if that's like the question but I think how I usually just what I usually tell people is that um, I'm an arts industry worker <laughs> you know um which you know again I think some people would see as like kind of like difficult or like in the weeds about it, but um, I don't know. I say that because right now, I mean, my my personal practice is very like nebulous, you know, like I don't do a whole lot of things like on my own. And honestly, the most times that I'm sort of flexing that sort of like 
what maybe would traditionally be understood as like artistry or creative practice, it's in service of capital, you know, like it's because I need a check. It's because I'm like contracted, you know, for for a project, you know. And so, I mean, and so I think there's, for me, I feel like there's honestly a lot of power in like reclaiming, I guess, or at least like underlying or emphasizing the fact that like, you are a worker, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're not, like your artistry is, I mean, it can, not everyone works in that same capacity. So, I mean, I think it is its own thing to define for you as an individual, but I think for me, emphasizing my identity as a worker helped me build a more comfortable relationship to it. Because then, you know, when you, when you do that, you're not entering some of these institutions from a perspective of like, they like they're not your community necessarily you know what i mean it's almost like the tradition i was saying which is like you s definitely need to know who the people are that you're working with you know their values etc so just because you're contracted to you know make something for some institution that is just because they know who you are and they support your work doesn't mean that you're there your community right um they're contracting you to, to make something um which ultimately for them is maybe for their community but that's not necessarily who your community is, they may be some overlap. So, and when I say community, I'm thinking about like aligned interests, you know, like aligned values, you know, like, so, and even you could say like politically, what are the things that, what are my priorities versus what are these, the, the people who are hiring these priorities, right? And everyone can make their own decisions about whether they still choose to work with people based on those like assessments. But yeah, I think, um, the ten around the tensions of um the identity of artists or like the label of artists yeah that's that's what it is for me i just like arts industry workers how i how i call it um i guess and i do make art sometimes but i wouldn't call myself an artist um so yeah expanding the term i think is looking at maybe like more so um what underpins your art or the things you're making or what and you know what pushes you to work in that specific realm of like artistry or whatever that's maybe one way of approaching it but I don't know um yeah curious what y'all thoughts are oh. um this is Patricia speaking um oh man I had a response to something Chad said and I lost it maybe I'll find it once I start talking um I feel like the, what I've found ever since I kind of had that like upheaval of, you know, not being as involved in the arts community and trying to find my way around like organizing, like building more connections within like my actual like physical community, like neighbors um, and people I'm like interacting with on day to day stuff like I have almost like pulled away from like art being at the primary thing that I contribute in my daily life like most of the people who know me like and you said in my bio um the work that I've done you know for like Janae's campaign I I was the campaign manager and Chad was actually a part of that campaign as well um which didn't feel like creative work most of the time it was a lot of like creative problem solving and responding to, to stuff but I um didn't exercise like a lot of like my art making um in organizing uh I think I like brought in a lot of people who like could help fill those holes because naturally like my community is made up of a lot of creative people um but I kind of resisted it and I think like you know in the conversations leading up to this panel and even today I don't know if I have a clear answer on like where I am on the spectrum I, I definitely have tensions with like being like I'm an artist because I do think there's a real concern about how artists are not seen as like seen as workers and laborers when really like you look at like anything in our life you know like anything from like a billboard to the color of clothes you know everything there's creative people making decisions within any environment um that inform like how our world exists and yeah I don't know where I'm at necessarily in that but when I think back over the last like years like 
after being fired from the art institute, like my studio space became so insular. Um, like I have sewn a lot, I've taken pictures. I try to take pictures um, a lot more now. Uh, and I don't feel like as, you know, I, I talked in the last question about um, the doing versus being. Like, I feel like when I allow myself to just be an artist for myself, I feel less compelled to like, make something out of it if I know that I'm practicing my values elsewhere in another capacity. It might be like leading a campaign or organizing like a community meeting, whatever it is, you know, like I I have had a really difficult relationship with it and it's it's helped me see my studio in a different way. And I think in a lot stressful way, sometimes so much so that I don't end up going to my studio at all because I'm not prioritizing it in terms of like labor um but it is kind of freeing to to take myself out of that like cog for a little bit to focus on like my own personal journey in that this is Nasir definitely agree with everything that's been said so far uh yeah I just think also on the question that like even beyond trying to call oneself like an artist or like a singular term, it's like not only extremely limiting, but also like explicitly tied to like capital. And I feel like all of my engage engagements with artistry so far has been for survival. And so it's like, if I didn't, uh, if I didn't have the money or the capital or the resources to create, um, it's like, would I even consider myself an artist or would the people around me consider myself an artist if I didn't have uh, the means to create in the first place? Um, I think specifically in Kansas City, like the arts realm is like extremely new to me. Uh, I consider myself like just like an abolitionist or an organizer first and foremost. Uh, I moved to Kansas City in 2021 after graduating college. And when I came here, uh, I came here from like the New York area. So when I was coming to Kansas City, I was like, child, <laughs> uh, I would say my prayers, but also like trying to find community along the way, um, specifically Black queer people. And that was really, really difficult in Kansas City, um, more difficult than uh, I guess I would have thought, and I guess I was like a little naive, like coming here trying to find that. Uh, and so this like personal project of like trying to find community kind of be became like this larger question of like, what is the prevalence of like black queer people in Kansas City? And so I started doing a lot of uh, historical research and like digging into Kansas City's like local institutions, like archives, libraries, etc., uh, community building. And so now I'm like working on like this like archival project, like documenting Black queer history. There's such like rich history here that has been erased uh, because of fascism, because we're in like red states like Missouri and Kansas, etc. But I say all that to say and that like the work that I'm doing, I feel is to like build collective power, build community across generations from like young new black queers in Kansas City to like elder generations where those connections are like severed or like not as clear because black queer people in Kansas City have been dis displaced. And then I was doing the research project through the defenders specifically. Uh, because I see writing again as a tool for survival, a tool for me to like share my voice where in other outlets in Kansas City, uh, like the Kansas City Star <laughs> would not be like open or interested in sharing this work. And I feel like now, like in the past couple months or so, there's like some shift where like, I'm having to talk about my work as art uh, and like talking about things as like interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary and like using whatever mediums, et cetera, in my exhibitions of this work, um, just to like create like a new pathway and again, like survive so that like these like foundations and 
uh, people, etc., can send me a check so I can keep doing this work, not doing it for free, so I can like eat dinner or like have a meal. Um, doing this work as like my personal passion, um, but also because I feel like it's extremely important and like organizing for a better Black queer future in Kansas City. So yeah, I think that I feel like using the term artist or a lot of times that I've personally seen uh, in the past several months, like in the art industry, it's like the work is like somehow supposed to be like divorced from everything else that I'm doing, but they're all like as explicitly tied and all these systems are working in tandem. Um, and so, yeah, I don't even know if there is like expansion or redefining the term artist. I really just think that if you want to know more about the work I'm doing, you should just like ask me and let's have a conversation. I can't tell you one word that I'm doing because period, it's not one word. <laughs> it's multiple words, multiple sentences, paragraphs, essays, etc. of what I'm trying to do. I can't tell you that in just one phrase. I mean, you talk about this, I mean, each of you talk about this, like, uh, like multiplicity of like roles um, and, and ways of being. Um, and like, survival is like a word that has like come up kind of a lot in each of each of your answers, like using uh, community organizing as a means of survival, using like art as a means of survival, using, you know, X, Y, Z as a means of survival. And I feel like it all sort of comes to this need for uh, like ensuring like a like better future for ourselves, uh, a, a this sort of day to day existence of like making sure that like basic needs are met. Um, but also like this um, within survival, there's this like deep need for community that I'm hearing from each of y'all. Um, and um, I'm just kind of interested. Uh, I wish we had more time in this panel. I feel like we're like 10 minutes away, but like, <laughs> we, like uh, in this work towards survival, in this work towards community organizing, like I'm really interested in, in knowing, um, I guess like how um, imagination is a tool to expand, like what feels possible for people, for ourselves. Um, and like, what are the limits that you encounter in the work that you do? You know, um, uh, something that we touched on a little bit, uh, you know, we talk about, um, uh, workplaces that might be perpetuating harm. Something that we haven't really talked about deeply is, uh, you know, community organizing and the sort of like burnout that happens um, in these spaces um, because they echo the urgency of the place that we live in, right? Like we live um, in uh, a, a white supremacist world where the the pace of things is is fast and moving and it it leaves people behind. And we're organizing to sort of try to like keep a pace with the things that, uh, that, 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 uh, sorry, I don't know, like take us down or something, but you know, uh, there's, there's so many limits that I feel like each of you like um, are able to talk about more extensively um, that I'm hoping to, yeah, turn back over to y'all. Um, I'll go first. This is Patricia uh, and I'll go quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, I think, so if we're, Obviously, like the people on this call, I imagine have like a good understanding of resources as far as resources, privilege, you know, like people, a single black mom will not be able to show up in the same way that somebody who's like younger has maybe like, you know, job stability insurance, like there's differences in like how people's like uh, individual lives, at least in my experience in organizing, like the way that people show up is a lot of times determined like by their actual like abilities um around their life not how much they like want to or see themselves in the movement but it's just like a capacity thing um for a lot of people and I feel like if we kind of put that aside as that being like obviously like that type of limitation being the first and foremost that like keeps people out I think a lot of people um and Janae and I actually also I do want to correct Chad was a part of Janae's campaign so was Hope I'm sorry, Hope, you were a part of it as well. Um, like Janae and I talked a lot in the beginning of the campaign 
um, because a lot of the initial work prepping for that campaign was very like between us two, like a small collective before we built like a working team. Um, a lot of conversation about like creativity came about because, you know, Janae constantly kept referring to me as like the creative person um, of us too, because I have, you know, a background in the arts, like I am a photographer and a quilter. And I remember looking at her one day and I was like, you are like the most creative person I know. Um, and I, I meant that because I think like outside of like resources as limitations, a lot of time it is just like mentally where people are able to like see themselves in the world. So many people don't have the ability to, you know, see radical change or feel positivity or like the possibility for something to come from their own actions. Um, and I, you know, like I really, I looked at her and I was like, you know, out of all the people I know, you have like one of the most creative minds because you're able to like look at the world that like, you know, is like set up to like hurt you and your kids in every single way. And you say, I see something different and I'm going to fight for it. Um, so I would say that being able to like see a person, you know, like your own person in it um, and seeing like a different future is a big part of that. Um, I, I can go, this is Chad. Um, so, I mean, yeah, about the limits, you know, I think one of the things that comes up for me is that, um, I think for a long time, especially being like, it, I think growing up and I think being oriented towards like the coast in terms of like, you know, in terms of like New York or LA, all these bigger metropolitan cities for what was interesting and cool. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, which is like literally like the middle of the United States for folks who aren't in the States. Um, so in the Midwest. And I mean, I was always interested in just the world and everything else. And so I think that for a long time, I was always looking for like, as I got older, um, I mean, I'm now only three hours away from where I grew up. So it's not that far away. But um, but I was always searching for like one singular space that was like, I was gonna like, okay, I'm gonna go here and they're gonna have all the black queers and they're gonna have all the best music and they're gonna have all the best style and they're gonna also be like politically set, you know, all these sort of things. Um, but so coming back to the idea of limits, I think as I've gotten older, I've just recognized that it's like, I think that there's never, you can never, you know, expect one singular organization or like relationship or like space to be able to like hold everything for you. Um, and that's not to say like we need to compartmentalize necessarily. I think vulnerability is very important, but it's more so about like expectations and acknowledging that there's different, um, there's, you can find your support in different ways, depending on what it is you're seeking support for. And I think obviously that's easier said than done finding those like avenues for support or you know, I think can sometimes be very difficult, but in terms of limits, I would just say like sometimes feeling like there's like there's no one space that can hold the like the the like multitudes of you, I think makes a lot of sense, especially in organizing spaces. You know, you may just like be start to feel very disenchanted or disconnected from a thing. Um, so yeah, I would say that in terms of uh limits. Um, but I guess in terms of the collective imagination piece, yeah, I don't know. I would just say, like, obviously it's very important. And I was talking to a friend about imagination the other day and how, like, imagining with people is very good. I grew up doing all that alone a lot of the times, like just creating my own characters and just talking by myself, walking in circles, talking to myself. And I still do that today. But also growing up to recognize I have to share with other people. And that's where actual like breakthroughs are meant. That's where you see the connections between real stuff. And then also the idea that imagination has to be followed with action, right? Like we can imagine all day, but if we're not actually like implementing or like trying to practice in some sense, then I think it then just becomes like, then it becomes like dream, like just like fantasy in a way is how I see it. So um, yeah, but that's what I would say. I know we're out of time, so I'll probably just speak for like two seconds, <laughs> but this is Nasir. Um, I think 
limit is just glaringly obvious, like money and capital uh, and like other resources that are like relegated to like the upper class, especially in Kansas City. Uh, I think specifically being in the Defender or even just what I mentioned earlier about Black queer people in Kansas City is that there are no spaces for us to congregate. So we're often having to like hop around or like ask permission from like other uh, large organizations uh, in our landscape to like meet in their spaces. And then I think with that too, um, like, sometimes like the people who like open our spaces up to us uh want to dictate the ways like we can show up in those spaces and you know that just makes it hard again to like organize towards like a better better future um of the same token i think when we are able to congregate and organize in the ways that we need to and want to um what we can imagine together is like great um and uh I'm really, like really into this idea recently of like being able to go slow. I don't think like we take a lot of time to like not be in the work uh, and like be in like a state of reflection and see if like the work that we're doing is actually impactful uh, and like conceptualizing new ways of organizing or new ways of building community, not just within ourselves, but like across communities in Kansas City. Um, not a fan of like uh that whole like movement right now that's like rest is a form of protest and like some of y'all be resting your whole life or like it's like white cis hat person is like rest is a form of protest so i'm like get that ass up and pick up pick up a picket fence or something and like let's go to the streets because why are you resting but i do specifically think that uh especially in communities where the work has often fell on them, Black women, Black queer people, people on the very fringes of society. For us, being able to go slow uh, and to be able to like be in a state of reflection and like truly rest, like being able, like not having to work in order to survive um, would be great. And I feel like we can't do that without like having space, which is a limit and like having like collective imagination as a subset of that. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much, everybody for sharing. Um, I know, yes, uh, we're out of time, but um, if people are able to stay, um, Nina, this is maybe a good opportunity for you to hop in to see um, if we're able to keep the Zoom room open. But um, I know that uh, folks are happy to, um, uh, you know, have a little Q&A session um, so we can sort of hear a uh, response from participants. This is Nina speaking. Yeah, I think it would be great for folks to ask questions or maybe share thoughts or ideas in response to what has been shared so far. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Hope. Um, thank you so much, all of you. I think this has been a really great panel. Uh, really interesting to hear all of the things that you had to say. Um, and I especially appreciated uh, the conversation about institutions and thinking about how institutions um, can sometimes uh, maybe not be acting in solidarity um, with, with individual artists or with the needs of the community. Um, I'm speaking as someone who is working in an institution um, and, and you know has been for 15 years or so, been working in arts institutions in the area. Um, and so my question is, uh, for those of us who are working in the institutions, um, are there ways in which we can act in solidarity for you? Uh, what, what practices, um, would make it easier um, for you. And understanding, you know, that the, the tension is never going to go away. I think it was Chad who said, you know, our our community is not your community. And I, you know, 
recognize that and appreciate that, but um, but surely it can be a little bit better. Uh, so um, do you have, have suggestions or, or practices that you uh, would recommend? If I could say something, one thought that I have related to that is that it's like, I think it's like being, I mean, yeah, sure. I think there's always limits to how, you know, how far an institution can go, especially, you know, when they're made for, they're not, maybe not at their core made for, you know, the most marginalized. But I would say that like, actually listening when people call you out is a pretty significant step, if anything. Um, I think that one um, instance locally that, I mean, I think that at least a couple of us are familiar with was like, I used to work at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art here. And I think, in, I believe it was 2019 or 18 or so, there was like a, one of our board members, uh, Mariner Kemper, he had like, in, he's like CEO of, I believe it was, um, I forget which bank it is actually, I don't want to misspeak. Um, but um, essentially he had investments in a like detention center in Rhode Island. And um, that was found out. It was written about in, um, what's that magazine? Is it Art Forum or something like that? Um, and so there was like all this attention on it and, you know, community members did protest about it. And um, essentially there was no genuine action taken behind it. You know, the I think the response was just as essentially kind of like a we're listening <laughs> kind of like kind of like response which is always so so played like are you listening though like whatever um so i think it would at least be like be prepared to actually take action when people like don't be so rigid i i would say is like the core of that because a lot of these institutions the idea is like yeah we'll listen but we're not going to change anything and they're not going to change anything because they don't care largely because the people calling them out aren't the ones who are they're not the um, donors or whatever else so I would say like there's there's a lot of aspects of it which are actually paying attention when people call you out and also like not being so rigid acknowledging that some things have to change if you're really about that shit you know like really about um, liberation in any capacity you have to be flexible um, especially as you know an institution that holds a certain amount of power and space so um, and I think the genuine like redistribution of resources like is like a is a powerful thing as well. And that can come in a lot of different ways. And like partnering with like genuine partnerships with other organizations. I, I don't know. Those are just a couple of things that come to my mind. Yeah, thanks for your question. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to invite if anybody else had questions um, to raise their hands um, like Rebecca did, throw it in the chat. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, Nina, what do you think? One or two more? Yeah, this is Nina speaking. That sounds fine. We have a couple more questions. That'd be great. Thank you for raising your hand. Um, Z, please, would you like to go ahead? Um, hi, this is Z from Croatia, uh, Balkans. Uh, and I'm curious if there is any uh, form of solidarity you experience with uh, immigrant communities from, from Eastern Europe at any point. I know they often feel like uh, culturally closer to people of color than to the white Americans of uh, Anglo-Saxon origin or like the, the privileged white or, or the to, to uh, but they are often appearing as white. Uh, and therefore, uh, maybe uh, closer to, to uh, power and uh, having uh, access to, to resources 
uh, in context where they also feel like they don't belong and they were also not built for them. Uh, I'm really curious about this because when I was visiting the US, for me, this was like really, really radical uh, experience of how different we are uh, uh, culturally. People who have experienced socialism and have been through transition and then actually uh, came to, to a country where capitalism is like fl fl flurry, fully flourishing in like this neoliberal society. No, thank you for sharing that. You know, your, your comment, yeah, it brings up a question that I've had my, for myself, like about, about this panel, which is, which is so US specific, right? Um, and like the, um, uh, our sort of like takes on solidarity are, are so specific to uh, like the relations that we have like racially and, and class-wise like with each other, right? Um, and so um, like, I don't know if I particularly have an answer for your question, but I, maybe maybe just boosting the comment of like, um, this looks different in different contexts, right? And like our, even within this panel, we have like the microcosm of like Kansas City politics that we're talking about, right? And then the, mic the microcosm of like United States politics. And, you know, there's just, um, I think there's like many parallel conversations that can be had um uh that um i certainly can't speak to uh but um would be interested in seeing how this this panel uh, evolves like uh, with with other with other people you know um in in the in the room but i don't know if anybody else had any thoughts to that comment or question heard thank you so much Yes, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, so something that I've noticed a lot, like I used to live in Chicago and um, now I live here and I've seen a lot of like spaces, a lot of times queer spaces kind of end up, I don't want to say like imploding on each other, but like um, there's like this almost requirement to be entirely perfect when you're organizing like a lot of people will end up dropping out because they, you are not progressive enough um and I, I guess my question is more like how can we come back or like how can we like work around um people who might feel that like certain spaces aren't working because they're not working fast enough or um good enough is my question Hmm. I can um, answer a quick like thing that we and I say we in terms of like the people I have organized with um, repeat often is we build at the speed of trust um, and I think it goes back to if you know, and I, I see that you have like a, you know, maybe tattoo shop name, uh, like it might be coming from like a business owner side, maybe the question instead of like an institution. But I do think like, regardless of scale of what establishment, like you're trying to bring people into, um, I don't think it's so much as like how quickly you're willing to like change or adapt, but how much you're actually working to get to know the people you're trying to like provide something for. Um, I do think like, you know, uh, an institution like the Nelson or the Kemper or the Kansas City Art Institute um, can make really quick changes in staffing personnel, um, you know, like whatever it is, like practices on campus. But if there's no trust being built or relationships being prioritized outside of that work, um, I would say then it's being done um, not for nothing, because I don't think that that's true either, but I do think that um, it's a disservice to the type of work if it's not prioritizing the people um, like impacted 
the most by the work that you're doing. Uh, so I would start there. <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, if it is like uh, community organizations, I feel like, again, if like people are like trying to build fast, that's not like for community, that's like for productivity, like that is for capitalism. Uh, and also too, like if, I guess the people like leading like these like queer organizations are saying that like, uh, that the people, that some people who are joining are like, not on their level and not building fast fast enough again that's like not the vision of like queer kansas Cityans. then that's the vision of like the people leading it and uh not to say that like there isn't any changing that but uh, i think it is worth like interrogating that interrogating them um and being like you know are you really here for like solidarity solidarity and liberation are you here for your own agenda uh something I think that we practice at the Defender, it's like kind of two things. Like one, well, we spent like a lot of time at the beginning of this year, like doing uh, like different like visioning sessions and like strategizing with like all our members uh, from like all different facets of our organization. And like, uh, I think that, yeah, one, I think it's important that like uh, community uh, organizations uh, be a vessel like for for all kinds of people and so I guess what I'm trying to say is like on one hand like we're doing like editorial coverage and like investigative reporting like on our website and stuff but then there are also people who are like doing like five person like poetry drawing free time like in the organization like that's fine like I think there's like space for all of that. Um, and like all of it is like doing the work of like building community and like uh, moving towards liberation. Uh, and two, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah. I just think that I'm curious to know what organizations you're talking about, but I just think that, yeah, I, they're like losing the plot if they're like moving at like their own speed or their own agenda rather than for community. And I feel like that's not a say on you or like who you may be speaking for. Of course, I don't think any space should like hold that much room for people who are like actively being harmful or like not committing to growth. Um, but yeah, at the same time, like we gotta be like real about the situation. Um, one quick thing I would say and related to what y'all were just reminding me of is that it's like, yeah, accountability. So in a situation like that, who are they actually, I guess, the leaders or whatever, like, what are the mechanisms of accountability that actually show that they are like, you know, that actually, I guess, would hold them to account in terms of like, building the power or like, in a res I don't know, respecting everyone and also building power in ways that I don't know that are like there's their community agreements like what are like what are the rules or by which they are saying it's not fast enough or progressive enough um so um yeah yeah the other thing I would say is like sort of like Nas was saying if there's no if that's not the vision of the people that's the vision of a couple people and if and to a further extent like what power are you building if you're like three people you know what I mean trying to have this super radical vision and it remains those three people for, you know, like the next two years. So um, I would question their actual interest in like building power, I guess. Yeah, like what power are you building if you're like leaving people behind, right? Yeah. Okay, friends, maybe it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Nina, do you have an outro for us or should I, should I, um, uh, conclude this panel for everybody. You can conclude it if you'd like to, um, but yeah, if you want to go ahead and thank everyone, that's cool. Hey, I appreciate everybody so much for coming and participating um, and organizing this panel. Um, I really, I just like love gathering the people who have relationship with each other to speak about these types of things and 
Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the participants um, and also unfamiliar faces. And um, I'm glad we had this opportunity to connect with everybody. So thank you for coming to this session um, and take care. Yes. And just thank you from the art and feminism side. Thank you, Hope, Patricia, Chad, and Nasir. And thank you to all of our interpreters and folks who joined us today. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Bye.